One of the most mysterious characters in A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones is Varys, the Master of Whisperers, or Spy Master at King's Landing, also called the Spider for his vast web of informers. Varys is a schemer and a manipulator, a master of disguise and illusion, and a keeper of secrets. Whenever anything important happens at court, he's there, watching, whispering, spinning his secret webs. What's this guy up to? Who is he really? And what does he want? Let's start at the beginning. Varys was born not in Westeros, but in a city called Lys, as an orphan boy and apparently a slave. He tells us that he grew up with a troop of mummers. Mummers are actors or performers, but one day in Mir, he was sold to a sort of a sorcerer who cut off Varys's cock and balls and burned them in a magic ritual. Varys was left for dead on the streets, but he managed to survive and become a great thief. When he was driven from Mir, he went to Pentos and formed a criminal partnership with a young Illyrio Mepatus. Varys trained children to work for him as thieves, like a sort of a fagin without balls, and came to learn that secrets are worth more than silver or sapphires. So Varys's thieves stole information, which eventually made Varys and Illyrio rich and powerful. Meanwhile, in Westeros, King Aerys Targaryen was going mad, convinced that everyone around him was plotting against him. So when Aerys heard about Varys's talents, he brought him to King's Landing to serve as his spymaster. In the following years, Varys crouched at the king's side, whispering in his ear like Grimmer Wormtongue, feeding Aerys's paranoia, which probably contributed to Aerys's madness and ultimate downfall in Robert's Rebellion. It doesn't seem that Varys intended this, though, because he apparently tried to stop Aerys from opening his gaze to the sack of King's Landing. But anyway, Varys continued in his role as the Master of Whisperers under the new king, Robert Baratheon. He learned all the secret passageways around the Red Keep. He built up his network of spies, mostly mute children who he calls little birds. And he solidified his power by making people need him, convincing people that he's on their side, making sure he's too useful and knows too much to be gotten rid of. And eventually the series begins. Varys's actions, as seen through the eyes of Eddard and Tyrion and others, are confusing. In Book 1, Varys warns Ned that the Lannisters want to kill Robert. He reports on Daenerys Targaryen to the small council using Jorah as his spy, though we later find out that Varys actually protects Danny. Varys suggests the dismissal of Barris and Selmy from the Kingsguard, and he tries to save Eddard from execution. In Clash, Varys is helpful and almost friendly with Tyrion, helping him run the city and protect his relationship with Shay, but in Storm he testifies against Tyrion in his trial, but then he helps save Tyrion from execution and leads him to kill Tywin before sending him off to Pentos. Then Varys disappears from King's Landing, leaving a coin in the dungeons that makes Cersei mistrust the Tyrells, and he's gone for all of Feast. But at the end of Dance, he turns up out of nowhere and murders Pycelle and Kevin Lannister. What's he trying to achieve with all this? What's the goal here? It's really hard to see Varys' motivations, because he does everything indirectly and secretly and subtly, but it is possible to piece together his grand plan. Back in the very first book, we see that Varys is conspiring with his old friend Illyrio Mopatus, who arranges the marriage between Daenerys Targaryen and Khal Drogo. We're told that the plan at this point is to use Drogo's Dothraki army to invade Westeros and crown Danny's brother Viserys as king. But Viserys dies, then Drogo dies, and Daenerys ends up the Queen of Marine, so in the show the plan now seems to be to help Daenerys take over Westeros. But in the books, it's more complex. There's this boy called Young Griff, who Varys and Illyrio claim is actually Aegon Targaryen, the son of Prince Rhaegar and nephew of Daenerys, widely believed to have been killed as an infant during Robert's rebellion. Varys and Illyrio say they secretly rescued Aegon from the war, and have been raising him ever since to be a perfect king for Westeros. Which raises the question of what they were planning to do with Viserys. Viserys and Aegon can't both be king. One likely explanation is that Varys and Illyrio lied, and never actually intended for Viserys to be king. And why would they? He's crazy and cruel, and would obviously make a bad ruler. Aegon, on the other hand, seems a pretty decent kid, and has a better claim to the throne, and has been shaped for rule since before he could walk by Illyrio and Varys's people. They clearly want Aegon, not Viserys, on the throne. So why do they try to give Viserys a Dothraki army? Why tell him to invade Westeros? The plan seems to have been to use Viserys' Dothraki invasion of Westeros as a way of destabilising and distracting Westeros, making it easier for Aegon to turn up later and take over. Compared to crazy Viserys and his savage foreign army, Aegon would look like the good guy. 
a saviour come from across the sea to bind up the wounds of bleeding Westeros. Of course, after Viserys dies, the plan changes. For a while, they try to get Aegon and Daenerys together to marry them and join their forces and invade Westeros together, but that doesn't work out, and Aegon ends up invading Westeros without her, landing in the Stormlands with an army called the Golden Company in Dance. So the plan has changed a lot throughout the series, but the overall goal seems to have remained the same, to make Aegon Targaryen the King of Westeros. This really helps to understand Varys' actions throughout the series. Early on, he's trying to delay any conflict in Westeros until Viserys is ready to invade, so he tries to protect Robert and Ned from the Lannisters, and he maintains an appearance of loyalty by informing on Daenerys, while on the down low he's supporting her, not only by protecting her from assassination, but by sending useful people to her, like Sir Barry and later Tyrion. By the end of Storm, Varys changes his strategy, trying to destabilise and weaken the Lannister regime in preparation for Aegon's invasion. So he leads Tyrion to kill Tywin, he drives apart Cersei and the Tyrells, and he kills Kevin Lannister, the last person at this point who's really holding the realm together. All throughout the series, Varys is working to pave the way for Aegon's invasion. But why? Varys endlessly says that he serves the realm, that he's a loyal servant of the realm, and the realm needs peace. If that's true, why does he create conflict and chaos and try to start a war to install Aegon as king? If Varys wants a good Targaryen king, he should have just supported Prince Rhaegar all those years ago. Rhaegar sounds like he would have been a great ruler, and since he was Aerys's rightful heir, there would have been no war required to make him king. But Varys actively worked against Rhaegar by warning the Mad King against him, possibly even urging Aerys to disinherit him so that crazy kid Viserys would have taken the throne instead. If Varys really wants a good king and a peaceful realm, why did he undermine Rhaegar? And later, under King Robert, the realm enters a period of peace and prosperity. The World of Ice and Fire calls it a golden era. Admittedly, there is that massive debt, probably because of Littlefinger, but still, the realm's doing pretty well. So why does Varys spend this time plotting to ruin the peace, start a war, and install a new king? After Robert dies, things do get bad in the War of the Five Kings, which again is mostly Littlefinger's fault, but the war does end and the realm starts getting back into pretty good shape under Tommen. Varys says himself that Kevin Lannister does a good job of starting to make peace and unite the Seven Kingdoms under Tommen's rule, but instead of supporting what could have become a peaceful, stable regime, Varys again undermines the peace by killing Kevin, creating conflict, and continuing the plot of Aegon's invasion. That's three potentially peaceful and prosperous regimes that Varys has actively undermined. If Varys really just wants a peaceful realm, why does he keep doing this? What possible reason could he have to support this kid Aegon above all others? Varys suggests that Aegon would be a great king. He says he's been trained, educated, instilled with good values, shaped for rules since before he could walk. But isn't it extremely naive to believe that training can guarantee that someone will be a great king? Aegon's just a teenager with little experience of the real world, he's barely even been to the realm he intends to rule. Even if Aegon does turn out to be a great king, what's stopping his heir or successor from being just as bad as Mad Aerys? Within just a generation, Varys' grand plan could easily leave Westeros in a worse position than it was in the first place, and that's if the plan even works. If Aegon is defeated, thousands would lose their lives for nothing. And the original plan, sending Viserys in first, is even more risky. Loosing thousands of Dothraki savages on Westeros would be terribly destructive and cause lots of long-term problems. And what if Viserys actually succeeded in taking over Westeros? He could do all sorts of damage, and it's not like he'd happily hand over the crown when Aegon showed up. Varys's supposed plan for peace involves an awful lot of war and destruction and risk, and he's actively sabotaged several other much safer opportunities for a peaceful realm to pursue it. It seems obvious that Varys and Illyrio's true goal isn't just a peaceful realm, but a realm ruled by Aegon. But why? Why does a eunuch from Myr and a merchant from Pentos, men with no apparent connections to Westeros or the Targaryens, work so hard to put Aegon Targaryen on the Iron Throne? Tyrion asks this of Illyrio in Dance, and Illyrio says he hopes to make money out of it, but Tyrion thinks he's a liar, that there's something in this venture worth more to him than coin or castles. And Illyrio admits that even fat old fools like him have friends and debts of affection to repay. Who are these friends? What are these debts of affection? Could they explain the real reasons why Varys and Illyrio want Aegon on the throne? The answers may lie in a theory called the Blackfire Theory. 
To cover some history real quick, about 120 years ago, the king of Westeros was Aegon IV Targaryen, called the Unworthy because he was one of the worst kings the realm had ever had. He was corrupt and cruel, full of greed and lust. He fathered dozens of bastards, including Brynden Rivers, or Blood Raven, now known as the Three-Eyed Crow, and Shiera Seastar, who may be related to Quaith, and Aegor Rivers, called Bittersteel, and Daemon Rivers, who took the name Blackfire and a Black Dragon as his heraldry. On King Aegon's deathbed, he legitimised all his bastards, which put them in line to the throne. Aegon's trueborn son, Daeron, still should have been the rightful heir, but that was disputed by Daemon, who called himself king and fought a war against Daeron for the throne. Daemon was killed in this first Blackfire Rebellion, but Bittersteel, who supported him, fled Westeros, founded a mercenary company called the Golden Company, and swore to put a Blackfire on the Iron Throne. Over the next 50 years, there were five more Blackfire Rebellions, some led by Bittersteel and his Golden Company, until finally, in the fifth Blackfire Rebellion, a young Sir Barristan Selmy killed Maelys the Monstrous, the last Blackfire. Or at least, we're told that Maelys is the last Blackfire, but he was apparently only the last of the male line of House Blackfire, which might imply that the female line is still alive. Many fans believe that Aegon is a descendant of that female line, that he's not really a Targaryen at all, but a Blackfire. And there's strong evidence supporting this idea. We're repeatedly warned in visions and prophecies of a false dragon, or the Mummer's Dragon. A Mummer's Dragon is a cloth dragon on poles used in performances. And of course, Varus is closely linked to Mummers. He was raised by them, taught by them, and constantly uses their skills of acting and illusion. So the idea here is that Aegon is the Mummer's Dragon, the false black dragon who Varus presents as a Targaryen even though he's actually a Blackfire. Which fits perfectly with Varus's talk of power and belief and perception. He says that power resides where men believe it resides. And men believe that power resides in Targaryen blood, no matter if the boy is actually a Blackfire. Another little symbolic hint is a story we're told about a black iron dragon that was used as the sign for an inn until someone broke it and threw it away because it looked like the Blackfire dragon. But many years later, part of it washed up and the black iron had gone red with rust. This alludes to the story of Aegon. The Black Dragon, House Blackfire, was seemingly destroyed years ago, but a survivor has now emerged, disguised as a red dragon, a Targaryen. But probably the strongest evidence for the Blackfire theory concerns the Golden Company, the army that joins Aegon in his invasion of Westeros in Dance. It is super fucking weird for the Golden Company to fight for Aegon Targaryen, because the Golden Company was founded by Bittersteel to fight against the Targaryens for the Blackfires. They fought in the Blackfire rebellions, they were led by Blackfires, they are a brotherhood of exiles united by the dream of Bittersteel. And the dream of Bittersteel was to defeat the Targaryens and put a Blackfire on the Iron Throne. So why would the Golden Company fight for Aegon Targaryen? Tyrion questions Illyrio about this, and Illyrio brushes away the objection as if it were a fly, saying, eh, Blackfire Targaryen, tomato tomato, all the company really wants is to go home to Westeros. Which is like, maybe, but that seems to contradict Illyrio's earlier claim that the Golden Company fights for Aegon because of a contract writ in blood, which sounds like it refers to the Golden Company's history with the Blackfires. So there is a lot of uncertainty and secrecy here, but given what we know about the Golden Company, and given all these hints about the Blackfires and the Mummer's Dragon, it seems likely that the Golden Company fights for Aegon Targaryen because they know he's secretly a Blackfire. Some versions of the theory go further, suggesting that Aegon might not only be a Blackfire, but that he might be Illyrio's son. Illyrio clearly has affection for Aegon. He's really sad that he doesn't get to spend time with him. He praises him, gives him little gifts of his favourite food. He even has a chest of children's clothes in his home that may have been Aegon's when he was younger. Maybe Illyrio treats Aegon like this, because Aegon is his son. Aegon's Blackfire blood would come from Illyrio's now-dead wife, Sera, who had pale golden hair streaked by silver, just like a Blackfire, and a name that sounds like a Targaryen or Blackfire name. Sera may be this Blackfire survivor through the female line, and the mother of Aegon Blackfire with Illyrio. The evidence for this idea isn't very strong, but it would go a long way in explaining why Illyrio wants Aegon to be king. Illyrio deeply loved Sarah. He sacrificed a lot of political power and status to be with her, and after she dies of grayscale, he keeps her petrified stony hands as a keepsake. 
which is quite creepy, but it's also a clear expression of passionate love. Maybe Sarah wanted for her son Aegon what all her Blackfire ancestors had failed to claim, the Iron Throne of Westeros. It might even have been a promise me Ned sort of a situation. Maybe as Sarah was slowly dying of grayscale, she got her husband Illyrio to swear to honour her memory by granting her son his perceived birthright, the throne. This also could give Varys a pretty good reason to support Aegon Blackfire. Varys is a close friend to Illyrio and may also have been close with Sarah, so it makes sense that he might want to help support Aegon. Some people even suggest that Varys and Sera might be related, brother and sister, perhaps. After all, they both happen to come from Lys, they both happen to end up with Illyrio in Pentos, and maybe Varys shaves his head to hide the pale blonde hair that he may share with Sera. There's a hint for this in that another character who shaves his head bald is Egg in Duncan Egg. Egg shaves his head to hide his Valyrian blonde hair, and when Varys is introduced in the first book, He is plump, perfumed, powdered, and as hairless as an egg. Also, having Blackfire blood might explain why Varys was castrated in a magic fire ritual. We know that fire magic in this series sometimes requires king's blood, and if Varys is a descendant of the Targaryens and Blackfires, he has king's blood. Maybe that's why he was bought by the sorcerer in the first place. One more little thing is that we're told that only the blood of the dragon would ever know the secrets of the Red Keep, specifically its secret passageways. And as it happens, Varys knows those secrets very well. So it's possible that Varys is Sarah's Blackfire brother. But even if he's not, even if he's only a close friend of Sarah and Illyrio, those connections could help make Varys and Illyrio's grand plan make a whole lot more sense. Because the story we're told, that Varys serves the realm and just wants peace, doesn't make sense. Varys has actively undermined three potentially peaceful regimes, he's taken huge dangerous risks, orchestrated whole wars, all to crown a teenager who might not actually make a good king. Could this really be the ultimate goal of this master player of the Game of Thrones? All this stuff about debts of affection and the Blackfires and familial connections hint that there might be a deeper layer to Varys as a character. Because all this time, Varys has seemed to be so dispassionate, so cold and calculating. People see him as creepy, almost inhuman. Not as a man, but as a sinister, all-seeing spider, and a eunuch besides. Cersei says that the reason why Varys is so dangerous is because he doesn't have a cock implying that he lacks the passions and desires and weaknesses that motivate other people. And Varys plays this up, saying, oh, no one loves a eunuch, they sing no songs for spiders, and in the show it's suggested quite clearly that he has no desire, which leaves him free to work towards higher, rational goals, like a peaceful realm. But maybe there's more to Varys than this cold, rational exterior. After all, he grew up with actors, he's a master of disguise, he talks endlessly about the power of illusion, and he says pretty explicitly that his role as a sly, unscrupulous spy is an act. Maybe behind the act, behind the illusions, behind the curtain is a man, just a man with human passions, someone who works out of love for his friends and family. George Martin says the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. A cold, rational, scheming spider who manipulates politics and orchestrates wars for purely cold, rational reasons is not the human heart in conflict with itself. A much better story is that of a man who was born alone into the world, who was betrayed at a young age, who was cut and beaten and suffered, and so learned to cherish the family he had. A man who used illusion and deception to play the part of a passionless eunuch who only serves the realm, all the while secretly working over years and years out of love for his family, Illyrio, Sarah, and Aegon. Maybe this could be revealed in a climactic, dramatic scene where Varys' plans come crashing down, perhaps even the scene of Varys' death. Imagine a sudden, tragic, bittersweet realisation that this evil, scheming spider who stole and lied and started wars and killed good men who turned the whole damn realm into his puppet show did what he did out of love. Either that, or he's a merman. Thanks for watching. This video was drawn from the ideas of the Song of Ice and Fire fan community. There are links in the description to relevant essays and posts. The series by Brendan B. Fish on Aegon was especially influential here. A thanks also to all the patrons supporting this channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support this channel, please pledge at patreon.com slash oldshiftx. Cheers.